In this part four of our five part series, first we will do a quick review and summary of what we have learned so far about Edom to refresh our minds. And then we will have a general discussion about prophecy itself. And then we will dive deep into some pretty major prophecies about Edom. And we will see how Edom fits into prophecy. Okay, just to recap now what we've learned so far in part one, we learned of how when Moses led the children of Israel out away from Mount Sinai, where they were given the Ten Commandments, and led them in towards the nation of Israel, how the Edomites did not allow them to go through their land, and they had to go around. And this caused the children of Israel to grumble against God. And then we learned how Edom was subjugated by King David and became a vassal state to Judah. Well, actually to Israel, and then Judah under King Solomon, when the nation of Israel was divided into Judah in the south and Israel in the north. And then we learned how King Amaziah um, invaded Edom and took their gods, their idols, and set them up for himself in Jerusalem. And then we learned of because of their Baal worship, which was brought in by Jezebel and Ahab, how the northern kingdom of Israel was taken into captivity by Assyria. In part two, we learned how the nation of Judah was uh, taken over and Jerusalem was destroyed by the kingdom of Babylon under Nebuchadnezzar. And we also learned through the book of Psalms and the book of Lamentations uh, what Edom's role was in the destruction of Jerusalem, how they openly participated in it, and they dashed the children of Israel's children against the stones. And in the book of Ezekiel, we learn from the prophet how the Edomites had their eyes on the land of the Jews and the Israelis, and they helped Assyria and they helped Babylon to get them out of the land because they desired the land for themselves. And then we learned also from Ezekiel how God passed judgment upon them because of that. And then in part three, we learned of the, um, the Romans' involvement in Judea under the Hasmonean dynasty and how they set up the Herodian Edomite dynasty over Judea as kings and how these Edomite kings, the Herodians, um, had their role in the New Testament events, um, how Herod the Great slaughtered the innocents in trying to kill Christ and how his son beheaded John the Baptist, and how his grandsons were involved in persecuting the early church, and inciting the Jews to such hatred that they revolted against the Romans, uh, which ended up in the destruction of Jerusalem. Uh, we need to understand that prophecy is given in layers. Um, they're not... Uh, willy-nilly layers that make no sense. They're layers that are um, very laid out very precisely and that work together. To understand the layers, we can look at the Bible. Um, for instance, the flood of Noah was like a metaphor of the end of the world, where Jesus said, just like Noah's ark, so shall the world be when the end comes, or people will be wicked and they'll be laughing at the Christians and just the way they laughed at Noah. 
um, the Christians have a song, or, or Christians think of Christ, they call Christ the Ark, because he's like Noah's Ark, where everybody thinks it's not going to rain. Uh, they have a song, get in the Ark, get in the Ark. If you can't walk on water, you better get in the ark. Um, so this is like a metaphor of Judgment Day. The other metaphor that you'll find repeatedly is the destruction of Jerusalem. The first destruction of Jerusalem and the Edomite involvement in it brought judgment upon Edom. Um, now when we get up into Herod the Great's time and Jesus Christ's time, Jesus Christ came when, and preached his gospel. It's like the Ark of Noah. Um, and those who did not get in the Ark suffered in the destruction of Jerusalem. Those who did get in the Ark, they knew Christ's warning about uh, getting fleeing Judea when they see the Jerusalem surrounded by armies and they were the ones who escaped um, many Jews escaped also but basically speaking um, over a million Jews were were killed in Jerusalem and probably many many more in Judea during those times but the main point is that the prophecies against Edom were fulfilled in that the Edomites are no longer a nation. They have disappeared into history since the destruction of Jerusalem. Now, with prophecy, the, the, after the destruction of Jerusalem is like the end of the world. It's the great day of the Lord's vengeance. If we rem remember Jesus in Luke chapter 21, verse 20, he said, when you see Jerusalem surrounded with armies, then get out of Judea, because this is the day of vengeance, where all things written are fulfilled. So this is like the, the end of the world prophecies are being fulfilled on a scale of the Middle East. Now with Christianity the gospel is given to all nations of the world and now there's a second coming of Christ which is related to another destruction of Jerusalem, an Armageddon, which is involving the whole world. So each revolution of prophecy involves a greater part of the world. So now that the gospel has gone to all nations and has taken on a spiritual application, it's not just for one race, it's for all races and all people are being called into God's kingdom. Now places like, or nations like Edom take on a intellectual or metaphorical meaning. Now, before we get into that, uh, let's look at these prophecies, uh, end of the world prophecies from the Old Testament and the New Testament. There are many prophecies in the New Testament, some by Jesus Christ in the Gospels, and the Apostles also prophesied at certain times. And then there's the book of Revelation, which is a pure prophecy. It's, it's very symbolic. And it incorporates over 300 metaphors from the Old Testament prophecies. And we will see one example here when we talk about Izu. So without further ado, let's take a look um, at the, the major ones I'm picking out here. That, and we will see how Izu, God's judgment upon Izu, if we remember in Ezekiel 35, he said, when the rest of the world rejoices, you will be destroyed. This is Izu. And that you will become a symbolic of everything horrible. 
basically is what he said. And that is what happened in the destruction of Jerusalem by the Romans. But there's more to it. Now there's a spiritual Izu, which represents a, a type of unbeliever who will be destroyed also in the end of the world. They receive a special judgment for special reasons. So, beginning in Isaiah 34, we're looking at the, the day of the Lord, the day of vengeance, the, the end of the world. These are all referring to the destruction of the world. And this is about a sacrifice in Basra. Uh, Basra was the capital city of in Edom. Isaiah chapter 34, um, beginning in verse 1. <coughs> Come near, ye nations, to hear, and hearken, ye people. Let the earth hear, and all that is therein, the world and all things that come forth of it. For the indignation of the Lord is upon all nations, and his fury upon all their armies. He has utterly destroyed them. He has delivered them to the slaughter. Their slain also shall be cast out, and their stink shall come up out of their carcasses, and the mountains shall be melted with their blood, and all the host of heaven shall be dissolved, and the heavens shall be rolled together as a scroll, and all their host shall fall down, as the leaf falls off from the vine, and as a falling fig from the fig tree. That was a metaphor alluded to by Christ also, the fig tree dropping its figs. For my sword shall be bathed in heaven. Behold, it shall come down upon Idumea and upon the people of my curse to judgment. The sword of the Lord is filled with blood. It is made fat with fatness and with the blood of lambs and goats and the fat of the kidneys of rams. For the Lord has a sacrifice in Basra and a great slaughter in the land of Idumea. And the unicorns shall come down with them, and the bullocks with the bulls. And their land shall be soaked with the blood of their dust, made fat with fatness. For it is the day of the Lord's vengeance, and the year of recompenses for the controversy of Zion. And the streams thereof shall be turned into pitch, and the dust thereof into brimstone. And the land thereof shall become burning pitch. It shall not be quenched night or day. The smoke thereof shall go up forever. From generation to generation it shall lie waste. None shall pass through it forever and ever. But the cormorant and the bittern shall possess it. And the owl also and the raven shall dwell in it. And he shall stretch out upon it the line of confusion and the stones of emptiness. And they shall call the nobles thereof to the kingdom, but none shall be there, and all her princes shall be nothing. And thorns shall come up in her places, nettles and brambles in the fortress thereof. And it shall be a habitation of dragons and a court of owls. The wild beasts of the desert shall also meet with the wild beasts of the island. And the satyr shall cry to his fellow, the screech owl also shall rest there, and find for herself a place of rest. There shall be the great owl to make her nest, and lay and hatch, and gather under her sh shadow. There shall the vultures also be gathered, every one with her mate. Seek ye out the book of the Lord, and read. No one of these shall fail, none shall want her mate, for my mouth it has commanded, and his spirit it has gathered them. And he has cast a lot for them, and his hand has divided it unto them by line. They shall possess it forever. From generation to generation shall they dwell therein. And in Isaiah 63, we read another judgment upon Edom. And this is also a Judgment Day prophecy, which is related to the second coming of Christ. Isaiah 63, starting in verse 1. Who is this that comes from Edom, 
with dyed garments from Basra, this that is glorious in his apparel, traveling in the greatness of his strength, I that speak in righteousness mighty to save. Wherefore art thou red in thy apparel, and thy garments like him that treadeth in the wine fat? I have trodden the wine press alone, and of the people there was none with me, for I will tread them in my anger, and trample them in my fury, and their blood shall be sprinkled upon my garments, and I will stain all my raiment. For the day of vengeance is in my heart, and the year of my redeemed is come. And I looked, and there was none to help, and I wondered that there was none to uphold. Therefore my own arm brought salvation to me, and my fury it upheld me, and I will tread down the people in my anger, and make them drunk in my fury, and I will bring down their strength to the earth. So this is a judgment of God in Edom, his vengeance, and he's treading upon the Edomites like squashing grapes in a wine press. Um, now if we look at the book of Revelation, the book of Revelation borrows this prophecy for the second coming of Christ. So if we look at the Revelation prophecy regarding the wine press, we can read in Revelation chapter 14, starting in verse 14. And I looked, and behold, a white cloud, and upon the cloud sat one like the Son of Man, having on his head a golden crown, and in his hand a sharp sickle. And another angel came out of the temple, crying with a loud voice to him that sat on the cloud, Thrust in thy sickle, and reap, for the time is come for thee to reap for the harvest of the earth is ripe. And he that sat on the cloud thrust in his sickle to the earth, and the earth was reaped. And another angel came out of the temple, which is in heaven, he also having a sharp sickle. And another angel came out from the altar, which had power over the fire, and cried with a loud cry to him that had the sharp sickle, saying, Thrust in thy sharp sickle, and gather the clusters of the vine of the earth, for her grapes are fully ripe. And the angel thrust in his sickle into the earth, and gathered the vine of the earth, and cast it into the great winepress of the wrath of God. And the winepress was trodden without the city, and blood came out of the winepress, even unto the horses' bridles, by the space of a thousand and six hundred furlongs. So here we see the metaphor of the wine press of the vengeance of God, which is in Basra. And in Revelation chapter 19, verse 11, we also read of the wine press. And I saw heaven opened, and behold, a white horse, and he that sat upon him was called Faithful and True, and in righteousness he doth judge and make war. His eyes were as a flame of fire, and on his head were many crowns. And he had a name written that no man knew but he himself. And he was clothed with a vesture dipped in blood, and his name is called the Word of God. And the armies which were in heaven followed him upon white horses, clothed in fine linen, white and clean, and out of his mouth goes a sharp sword, that with it he should smite the nations. And he shall rule them with a rod of iron, and he treads the winepress of the fierceness and wrath of Almighty God. So you can start to see um, the Edomite prophecies uh, related to the end of the world prophecy. Jer Jeremiah chapter 49 also has a prophecy um, starting in verse 7 concerning Edom thus says the Lord of hosts is wisdom no more in Teman is counsel perished from the prudent is their wisdom vanished flee ye turn back dwell deep O inhabitants of Dedan 
for I will bring the calamity of Izu upon him, the time that I will visit him. If grape-gatherers come to thee, would they not leave some gleaning grapes? If thieves by night, they will destroy till they have enough. But I have made Izu bare, I have un uncovered his secret places, and he shall not be able to hide himself. His seed is spoiled, and his brethren and his neighbors, and he is not. Leave thy fatherless children, I will preserve them alive, and let thy widows trust in me. For thus says the Lord, Behold, they whose judgment was not to drink of the cup have assuredly drunken. And art thou he that shall altogether go unpunished? Thou shalt not go unpunished, but thou shalt surely drink of it. For I have sworn by myself, says the Lord, that Basra shall become a desolation, a reproach, a waste, and a curse, and all the cities thereof shall be perpetual waste. I have heard a rumor from the Lord, and an ambassador is sent unto the heathen, saying, Gather ye together, and come against her, and rise up to battle. For lo, I will make thee small among the heathen, and despised among men. Thy terribleness has deceived thee, and the pride of thy heart. O thou that dwells in the clefts of the rock, that holds the height of the hill, though thou should make thy nest as high as the eagle, I will bring thee down from thence, says the Lord. Also Edom shall be a desolation, every one that goes by it shall be astonished, and shall hiss at all the plagues thereof. As in the overthrow of Sodom and Gomorrah, and the neighbor cities thereof, says the Lord, no man shall abide there, neither shall a son of man dwell in it. Behold, he shall come up well, like a lion from the swelling of Jordan against the habitation of the strong, but I will suddenly make him run away from her. And who is a chosen man that I may appoint over her? Who is like me? Who will appoint me the time? And who is that shepherd that will stand before me? Therefore hear the counsel of the Lord that he has taken against Edom, and his purposes that he has proposed against the inhabitants of Teman. Surely the least of the flock shall draw them out. Surely he shall make their habitations desolate with them. The earth is moved at the noise of their fall. At the cry, the noise thereof was heard in the Red Sea. Behold, he shall come up and fly as the eagle, and spread his wings over Basra. And at that day shall the heart of the mighty men of Edom be as the heart of, of a woman in her pangs. A woman in her pangs is a woman in childbirth. So there's another prophecy in the book of Obadiah. Obadiah is the shortest um, prophecy in the Old Testament. It's one page, basically, in this book. And it's very much like Jeremiah 49. So I might as well read it now. But when I hear of Edom as he that dwells in the clefts of the rock like an eagle, and though you are so high, you will be brought down. First of all, the uh, original uh, habitation of Edom was Mount Seir, which is a very high mountain. And I imagine they did dwell in the caves around Edom. And also, you can think of King Herod in Masada and Herodium. He built these fortresses on tops of mountains. And so this is uh, another way that the layers of prophecy is talking about the ancient Edomites were taken down out of their clefts of the rocks in Mount Seir, and the Herodian dynasty as the Edomites were taken down from Masada and Herodium and brought to nothing. And the same will hold true in the end of the world. 
So we'll read Obadiah now, and this will be the final prophecy that uh, we will read out for Edom. And then we'll just end with a discussion about the whole thing. The vision of Obadiah. Obadiah means worshiper of Jah, of Jehovah. The vision of Obadiah. Thus says the Lord God concerning Edom. We have heard a rumor from the Lord, and an ambassador is sent among the heathen. Arise ye, and let us rise up against her in battle. Behold, I have made thee small among the heathen. Thou art greatly despised. The pride of thy heart has deceived thee, thou that dwells in the clefts of the rock, whose habitation is high, that says in his heart, Who shall bring me down to the ground? Though thou exalt thyself as the eagle, and though thou set thy nest among the stars, thence will I bring thee down, says the Lord. If thieves come to thee, if robbers by night, how art thou cut off? Would they not have stolen till they had enough? If the grape gatherers came to thee, would they not leave some grapes? How are the things of Izu searched out? How are his hidden things sought up? All the men of thy confederacy have brought thee even to the border. The men that were at peace with thee have deceived thee and prevailed against thee. They that eat thy bread have laid a wound under thee. There is none understanding in him. Shall I not in that day, says the Lord, even destroy the wise men out of Edom, and understanding out of the Mount of Izu? And thy mighty men, O T man, shall be dismayed, to the end that every one of the Mount of Izu may be cut off by slaughter. For thy violence against thy brother Jacob, shame shall cover thee, and thou shalt be cut off forever. In the day that thou stood on the other side, in the day that the strangers carried away captive his forces, and foreigners entered into his gates, and cast lots upon Jerusalem, even thou was as one of them. But thou should not have looked on the day of thy brother, in the day that he became a stranger. Neither should thou have rejoiced over the children of Judah in the day of their destruction. Neither should thou have spoken proudly in the day of distress. Thou should not have entered into the gate of my people in the day of their calamity. Yea, thou should not have looked on their affliction in the day of their calamity, nor have laid hands on their substance in the day of their calamity. Neither should thou have stood in the crossway to cut off those of his that did escape. Neither should thou have delivered up those of his that did remain in the day of distress. For the day of the Lord is near upon all the heathen. As thou hast done, it shall be done unto thee. Thy reward shall return upon thy own head. For as you have drunken upon my holy mountain, so shall all the heathen drink continually. Yea, they shall drink, and they shall swallow down, and they shall be as though they had not been. But upon Mount Zion shall be deliverance, and there shall be holiness, and the house of Jacob shall possess their possessions. And the house of Jacob shall be a fire, and the house of Joseph a flame, and the house of Izu for stubble. And they shall kindle in them, and devour them. And there shall not be any remaining of the house of Izu, for the Lord has spoken it. And they of the south shall possess the mount of Izu, and they of the plain, the Philistines, and they shall possess the fields of Ephraim, and the fields of Samaria, and Benjamin shall possess Gilead. And the captivity of this host of the children of Israel shall possess that of the Canaanites, even unto Zarephath, and the captivity of Jerusalem, which is in Sepharad, shall possess the cities of the south. And saviors shall come up on Mount Zion 
to judge the Mount of Izu, and the kingdom shall be the Lord's. Now that's pretty heavy duty prophecy, but you sort of get the gist of Izu's role in the destruction of Jerusalem and how God is taking a special kind of vengeance against them. If we remember, Izu was a vassal state of Judah, and they were well aware of uh, the laws of Moses, and they were well aware of the prophecies, and they did what they did anyway. So they have a greater judgment than when the Bible says the heathen or the Gentiles or the nations that is all the same Hebrew word it's really just the nations that are not Israel this concludes part four of our series in our next video the last one of the series we have gathered all the information necessary to understand who Edom is in ancient times and this information will help us to understand who Edom is in modern times and in the final day of the Lord. And who is Edom now? Who are they? And where are they? We'll see you in the next video.